In this video, we explore some common Agile concepts and terminologies. As you'll be working with Agile frameworks, uh, you need to be acquainted. You need to familiarize yourself with the terminologies that are oftentimes referenced in this environment. We begin with user stories. In Agile, uh, features or functionalities are written as user stories. Now, a user story is a piece of functionality written from the end user's perspective. Okay, so a user story typically has three parts. Okay, uh, the first part is the persona, is the end user performing the action, who that individual is. And then the second part or the middle part is the action or the expected functionality. And then the third part is the objective that functionality fulfills, okay? So uh, an example is what you see on your screen. As a supervisor, I would like to see all my subordinates work in one space on the system so I can monitor their progress. So this is a typical example of a user story. Now the developers who create uh, the end goal of this user story will understand the functionality as the user is performing it. They would understand it from the end user's perspective. Now a user story typically includes an acceptance criteria, okay, so that uh, once the goal is established, we can test it against that uh, criteria. So uh, it must have an acceptance criteria. It must be estimable, okay? We should be able to estimate for it. We should be able to test for it. It must be testable, okay? We should be able to test uh, for a user story. Take note of that. Now, one rule with user story is that it should be completed no more than three days, maximum of three days, a user story should be completed. Now, if you find out that a user story will require more than three days, it means that it's too big to become a user story. You need to split it up and then you meet or fulfill the goal of that rule. The next thing we look at is a sprint. Sprint or iterations often used interchangeably. Now, a sprint is a short time boxed period within which the team works on a set number of tasks or user stories to create a potentially releasable product increment. I think I have made it clear that on Agile project, of course, on every project, uh, we break down into smaller components. And on Agile project, uh, deliverables are broken down and one of the granular levels on which deliverables are broken down is a sprint. A sprint ultimately will contain a set of user stories, okay? And a sprint is a time-boxed period. Some teams work uh, in one-week sprints, okay? Which means that within one week, the user stories contained in the sprint must be completed. Others work within two weeks, others work within three weeks. And for large and complex projects, they work uh, within four weeks uh, sprint. Now, the reason we time box sprint is for the team to maintain a steady uh, progress, okay, a steady uh, pace when they are working, all right? And then the idea of breaking down into smaller sprint is for the team to celebrate uh, smaller successes. It's for the team to uh, create uh, increments or deliverables by installment. I think we've said enough about that when it comes to agile so when uh, a set of user stories are put together to constitute a sprint then the team can focus on those set of user stories and complete them and celebrate their victory upon completion the next concept we look at is definition of ready yeah so it's a concept on its own now, definition of ready defines the criteria a user story has to meet before it is considered or included in a sprint to be worked on, before it is committed to a sprint. Now, when user stories have been created, a number of things have to be done 
to them before they are committed to a sprint to be worked on. Because the moment a user story finds itself in a sprint, it is also um, an indication to the developers to begin working on the user story. But if a user story has not uh, been refined, if it's not been estimated, if the value has not been clarified, if stakeholders do not agree on the intended goal of that user story, and you commit it to the sprint and the developers start working on it, it will create problems. So definition of ready is actually a criteria and that criteria could be, has the value been clarified? Has the user story been estimated for? Do we know the end goal of the user story? Is there clarity in the user story? Is there consensus among stakeholders in terms of the value the user story is to create? All of these things can constitute that definition of ready criteria that we measure user stories against before we commit them to a sprint to be worked on. The next item we look at is the definition of done. It's also another criteria. Now, definition of done is the acceptance criteria that spells out the agreed set of items that a user story must fulfill before it can be considered complete. Now, as the developers work on user stories, they need to have a guiding uh, criteria, an end goal they are trying to fulfill, okay? So when we talk of definition of done, it's what we want to see after the user story has been completed, what, uh, how it must function before we would say that this has been completed. So what does done look like? That becomes our definition of done. Then we look at time box. When we say time box, what is it? Time box is a defined period of time within which certain tasks must be accomplished. Now in Agile, uh, a couple of things are time boxed. Like for example, we say that sprint is time boxed. So when we say sprint is time boxed to let's say two weeks or three weeks, what it means is that within that period, the end goal of that sprint must be fulfilled. Now, the reason we time box elements like that is so that the team maintains that steady pace, all right? And then uh, they organize themselves to achieve the end goal of that time box uh, endeavor uh, within that period. The next thing we look at is the team's velocity. When we say velocity, velocity is the team's rate of progress. We need to understand the development team, okay, and their rate of progress so that in planning for sprints, we know how to plan for the work because uh, it's not a good thing when the team is overburdened or overwhelmed with work, okay, but because that could lead to uh, burnout and loss of morale. Okay, at the same time, it sh they shouldn't be underwhelmed. Okay, so when we know the team's rate of progress, then we can plan work accordingly. With velocity comes velocity chart. Now, the velocity chart shows the number of user stories, point, task, story cards, hours, or features completed by the team in each given sprint or iteration. So it is the chart that reflects the team's velocity. So we know how they are faring, what was planned for, what they were actually able to implement, okay? And then we can plan work accordingly. The next thing we look at is work in progress limit. Work in progress itself stands for the number of tasks the team is currently working on. The work in progress limit is a rule that places a limit or determines the maximum number of tasks the team should work on at any given moment. It improves the focus and efficiency of the team and avoids the time cost of switching in between multiple tasks. Now, if you work with the Scrum framework, you may not find the need to do this because uh, Scrum, by virtue of its time box sprints, 
uh, fulfills this purpose okay but for kanban and it's actually kanban that uh, utilizes wip limits because kanban is not time boxed uh kanban is feature driven so there has to be a way of limiting the team to what they must do so wip limit is a rule that places a limit on the amount of work they can do at a given moment all right aha uh -huh. so that they can increase their focus and avoid that uh, time cost in switching in between multiple tasks. That way too, the team does not end up stretching uh, themselves too thin across many, many tasks. This is a very important chart in agile development. It's called a product bend down chart, okay? Now a bend down chart shows how much has been accomplished and how much is left to go so it looks at time and then the scope okay yes so that we know if we are ahead of time if we are behind time or we are on track that is what a bend down chart does yes so we are now on a very powerful technique that often eludes us very very powerful technique that it's very easy to lose sight of product box exercise. Now the product box exercise is an ideation process where we create the physical box that sells the idea. Now, what do we mean by this? You see, when you go out shopping, maybe you go to a mall or a supermarket, a number of products call out to you, okay? They call out for our attention. But what we see is not the product itself. What we see is the box. And there is something about the box that calls us to a particular product over its competitors. So in this exercise, instead of brainstorming the solution itself, we rather brainstorm or ideate around the box that would ultimately sell the product. Because when we think of packaging, when we think of the box uh, that will sell, the, we also think of placing the box in the marketplace among competitors, among similar products. Okay, and our cognitive process, our brains are engaged like never before, thinking of the most compelling features that will win out in an avalanche of noise. You get it. So uh, when it comes to product box exercise, we ideate around the packaging because we understand that packaging plays a very crucial role in informing purchase decisions with our target users. Okay. So uh, we go through questions like, what is the product name? What name will we put on the box? What are the ideal target users? Okay. Because, uh, uh, usually, we, we have to specify that so that those who fall within that target group will be called to the box. Is there any catchy phrase, tagline, or slogan that can draw people? What are its most compelling features or benefits? Sometimes uh, a product may have several benefits, but because we can't put all of them on a box, we brainstorm the most compelling features. And that way, we are able to even enlist the most compelling features that we should even create in the first place. And then if there is any imagery that will make the product stand out, we put all of that in the box. So the product box exercise is a very wonderful idea. And sometimes on the project, several team members or groups may be made to perform this exercise so that we see which group sells the idea best. Then we look at storyboard prototyping or wire framing. Now, when we say storyboard uh, prototyping or wire framing, it's a way of using visuals to narrate or demonstrate the solution as will be experienced by the end user. These mockups are designs that are created uh, to illustrate the way the end user will move around the solution. Do you get it? Uh -huh. So when we do that, then those who develop the product will understand that, oh, this is what stakeholders expect of the solution. When you tap here, it takes you there. When you tap there, 
it brings you here okay so it's a way of uh, replicating how the end product should look like a mock-up uh, creation kind of if uh, if you know about figma which is used by uh, a lot of um, software developers then you know what storyboard prototyping is all about then we look at spike now a spike is a time box task to explore or investigate an issue now ideally uh, when we put something on a story card is usually a user story that should lead to a feature or a functionality being created but sometimes there is an issue or maybe we even want to uh, estimate for how long a user story will take and we don't have enough information in that case we create a spike so a spike will also make use of time you get it all right only that a spike will not lead to a feature increment it's not produce any feature but it is to explore or research or investigate something so in the case where we want to know how long a user story will take and we want to perform some research on it then we create a spike and the objective of that spike is to uh, create an estimate for a user story we have already created okay so that is a spike yeah then we look at xp metaphor xp metaphor is a naming convention that explains how a system works i think it's still ambiguous here now when we talk of, of xp metaphor it's all about communication it's about the use of the right words correct labels simplified language so that everybody on the project can understand when we say xp metaphor we are establishing a naming convention by which we can communicate the idea of the product now you see in agile we have business representatives we have the customer we have investors we have the sponsors we have support staff all being an integral part of the team and if we have to use technical jargons in-house or domain uh, technical names then uh, we are going to have problems with communication and other people will not be able to understand what we mean so when we do xp metaphor we establish a naming convention so that people who are kept in the communication loop who are non-technical persons will also understand uh, the work how we communicate on the project and the product uh, the product idea itself information radiators information radiators very very important concept in agile development now when we talk of information radiators it actually has several names and we say it is the team area where information about the workflow is displayed and communicated it can be called a task board collaboration tool electronic board kanban board scrum boards you know all these are information radiators now in a physically co-located environment you find this on a wall where the team can stick the work in progress they can put all their plan work in one column if they are pushing or pulling work into progress uh, they keep moving the work the pieces like that okay it is called information radiator or a task board okay and people are able to know the progress of the project through that system now like i said before in this day and age we have electronic boards it doesn't have to be a physical space or a physical wall it can be an electronic wall like we have with jira like we have with trello okay all of these tools have that as a system in place that surface where you can uh, work like this okay now in traditional project management there is the regular use of you know traditional tools for communicating like emails like you know all of these communication tools but in agile project management uh, information radiators are the commonest communication tools okay if the sponsor wants to be informed about the progress of the project in traditional waterfall the sponsor expects to receive communication from the team expects to receive email expect to receive, receive fax 
fax document or whatever it is in order to know the progress of the project. But in Agile, he doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to wait for information because, like I said, all of these individuals are actually a part of the team. So once there is an electronic board, okay, they could actually be invited to the board. And wherever they are, they could actually log in and see the progress of the work. They can see what is going on. They can see which work items have shifted to done. They can see which, which work items have shifted from to do the product backlog and are currently being worked on. They see everything. That's Agile for you. So uh, sponsor doesn't wait on Agile projects to be informed because they all have equal access to information. They all have equal access to the boards where work has been displayed and then the progress of the work is naturally being communicated. Then we have the product backlog. I think this is straightforward, fairly. So it's a list of planned work to be executed, more or less our to-do list. That is the product backlog. So if you use electronic boards, your to-do will be your product backlog, where all the things that you plan to do have been arranged, and they keep on being prioritized by the product owner. Okay, so that is the product backlog. Then finally, we have product backlog grooming or refinement. When we say grooming or refinement, it's actually the same thing. It is the practice of constantly revisiting the product backlog to reprioritize work, remove irrelevant user stories, include stories from previous sprints, or add new user stories. Now, the objective of backlog grooming or refinement is to ensure that the product backlog remains populated only and only with relevant items that contribute value. So that's the thing about the product backlog and it's the responsibility of the product owner. Take note, the product owner who constantly performs this grooming, this refinement, because the product owner is constantly in touch with the customer. The product owner is the voice of the customer. The product owner is the one who understands the priorities of the customer, okay, and performs this grooming, performs this prioritization, and ensures that what is most needed is what is being worked on at all times i think we, we would end here this is the purpose of this video is not to achieve a total coverage of agile terminologies no um, some other concepts will be addressed under other appropriate headings as we move on within this series okay yeah so uh, i think this will be that for this particular uh, title Remember, we are still training for your PMP project management certification. Join us for in-person classes in Ghana, wherever you are in the world, in Africa, Europe, America. You can also join our online sessions. Remember, we have a very strong and effective post-training system to get you to the finish line. Also get in touch if you want to pursue the professional Scrum Master certification the Certified Scrum Master, or the Agile Certified Practitioner. Together, we will write that victory song. Thank you very much, and see you in the next lesson.